My base is dead. Dead, dead. Dead, dead, dead. And I'll be honest, I can't help but feel like Christmas is to blame. I haven't been on the Hermitcraft server for around about five or six days, and I should have known that that would definitely cause things like this to happen. We have lost two lives. That means, how many lives have we got left now? Have we only got four lives left? We've got four lives to last for the rest of the Hermitcraft season. Otherwise, I lose 64 diamond blocks. That's quite a lot of diamond blocks. Why did I do that? I didn't have to do that. I, I've totally... I've built the thing that is then going to cause me to lose the diamond blocks. Like, what? Who does that? That's like setting a trap and then priming it for yourself. So that you'll catch yourself with the trap. That's no fun. No, you don't, you don't want to be doing that. Absolute spoon of the century right here. But I created this monster and it's here to stay, so I guess I've got to keep feeding it. But I should actually quickly get back to the reason why I wasn't on the server for five or six days. You see, I wasn't just chilling out doing standard Christmas stuff. I'm a YouTuber. We don't have Christmas instead. I've been hard at work in the editing bay just cracking on with the Minecraft Earth Road Trip. You might remember, you know, we released a trailer for the Minecraft Earth Road Trip. We said it was going to be coming soon and it... it it didn't really arrive that soon, <laughs> but I finally got episode one finished and now I'm working on episode two and they should actually be arriving soon. It, it was a lot of footage, an awful lot of footage. But I'm really, really happy with it. I think it's come together really nicely. I think you're going to enjoy it. So make sure that you check out episode one, which will go up on Grian's channel and then episode two, will be coming out on my channel. Moving swiftly on, we have got some serious, serious terraforming to do. So we're going to need a decent number of these, a very decent quantity of this, and an even more decent quantity of these. Can anyone tell me what this is? By the way, I'm very curious by what this rather strange looking build is. So here we are. I would say we are now fully kitted out with everything that we could possibly need to do the terraforming in this area here. Yeah, I've been putting this off for longer than I think I've ever put anything off, it's about time that we did it. And you know what? I think I'm going to enjoy it. I just woke up this morning. I was so in the mood. So let's do it. And I 100% think it will work best in the form of a third person time lapse. And I've got to say, just doing this project has really taught me how much I've actually developed as a Minecraft player. You see, I've been playing Minecraft since 2011-ish. I've been making Minecraft videos since 2012. I've been a member of Hermitcraft since Hermitcraft Season 2. And as that time goes on, obviously you develop as a person and also as a, a, a Minecraft player. You know, you get more experience, your styles change, your interests change, you pick up new skills as you go along. And I definitely feel like one area that I have really developed in over the past couple of years has been my building in general, but more importantly, it's been in the organic style of building. You know, this idea of creating natural looking structures and things that look... They look, they're, they're like enhanced Minecraft natural, okay? Because, you know, Minecraft natural, it's it's functional, it's, it's great, okay? And with some of the new updates, it's getting more and more pretty, but I would never describe the game as being naturally beautiful. I, I think that's fair to say, whereas when you see the work that Scar does in creating these incredible terraform landscapes, like, you could quite happily describe that as being beautiful. And Scar and people like him are like the gold standard that I'm trying to work towards when it comes to my natural style of building. And I'm gradually picking up tips and tricks from them and seeing how they kind of piece together their builds. And as I say, it's definitely an area that I have had some pretty serious steps forward in. And I think it's something that you can clearly see in this Hermitcraft Season 7 building style you can see it creeping in a lot more it's something that i i fall to a lot more often and it's something that i genuinely really enjoy so let's see if my enjoyment has actually led to a decent end product so this is what i started with i've left this area currently untouched i'm gonna get on to terraforming that in just the next couple of seconds but yet yeah, this is this is what we started the episode with and now if i just quickly make my way over to this side and then do the old mumbo spin around this is what we currently have and that looks so cool. <laughs> it looks so cool. It's like, it's actually like the base is now integrated with the land underneath it, as opposed to being plonked on top. It now all feels like one unified thing. That is a huge, that is a huge upgrade. That is an absolutely enormous upgrade. This looks cool. This looks really, really cool. I'm gonna grab my bone meal and my bamboo and bits and bobs, and I'm gonna continue working on this little section here. I've just realized this little section is actually about a third of the build. I've still got quite a long way to go to get this thing finished. But after another couple of hours, everything is now all done. The base is all fully completed. 
and fully terraformed. And what's scary is when I originally built up the base of this thing and I kind of connected this tower to the ground underneath it, because you have to remember this tower was floating for a very, very long time. When I initially did that, I wasn't actually planning on doing any terraforming. I was going to leave it as it was. And it's only really been in the past couple of months that I've decided, actually, I probably should do something with this. And I'm so glad that I did. Because I know that at the end of Hermitcraft Season 7, if I hadn't done that, I would have been absolutely kicking myself. Anyway, time for the next project. And that is to fix up my villager breeder by fixing up my zombification chamber so that I can then fix up my iron farm. All I have to do is find a zombie that can pick up this helmet. And then I need to get that zombie with the helmet on into the place that I've constructed, which weirdly is a lot easier said than done. Here he is. This is my dude. This is my dude. Right, I have to protect him at all costs. And I need to make sure that I don't get killed in the process, but I- Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> Wait, hang on, what? How has that zombie gotten over there? There's a zombie on my bridge already! Oh goodness me, this has gone south. We could be in trouble. This is suboptimal. Hopefully, hopefully my dude with my helmet- He's in there! <laughs> There's a man in there! There's my guy! Okay, we need to make sure that that guy manages to find his way actually up here. This is good, this is good. He's holding an arrow. But I don't think that's an issue. If we can just, just, just coerce him along. He's not going to get distracted by the villagers and things. All right. And. He's dropped in. Yes. 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 Okay. Now we block this up. And we, we make sure that no zombies can actually just kill off all these villagers. My goodness me. Look how many of them there are. This is not a very mob safe zone. One diamond sword, one sharpness five enchanted book, and this guy should now be all kitted out. So there he is with his sword, and this should do him for his armor as well. Now the armor, the armor is just for looks, but the sword is helpful because it means that this guy will kill our villagers sooner. The way that this system works is our villager will drop down onto this little powered rail here. When I hit this button, the villager will then be sent across, be converted into a zombie villager, and then the zombie villager sits there waiting to be cured up. And the reason that you want to cure up your zombie villagers is because it then gives you cheaper trades for life. So for example, all these guys, because I've cured them up, trade iron for one iron per emerald which is amazing when you've got an iron farm over there that produces many thousands of iron ingots per hour except it doesn't at the minute because it doesn't currently work so that's why we're going to afk here overnight to get all the villagers required to actually get this thing sorted i will see you all tomorrow morning this is definitely the stuff that nightmares are made of a two-faced four-armed four-legged villager after a little bit of hassle the first module is now fixed up and ready to accept a villager so the issue was in minecraft 1.16 villagers when they went to bed could then wake up actually on the bed, which means they'd be outside of their modules and then eventually they'll walk off the side because they're stupid and they'd fall into the lava and they'd die. That's what's happened in both of these modules over here. Whereas now that we've got this extra carpet and string in place, these are now seen as illegitimate respawning locations or pop out of bed locations. So instead, they will pop out of bed in this location right here, which is exactly where we want them to be. And I guess now we find out if it actually functions. So those villagers were just in their beds and now they've popped out of their beds and they're in the correct spot i'm chuffed with that and now all of the modules are fully done and fully updated for minecraft 1.16 so now it's time to start pulling some villagers over which i'm sure is not going to be stressful in the slightest because working with villagers is never frustrating break your mine car and yeah no i, I hate you why are you not going what oh God, just i hate you i literally hate you what what go on you're basically in there yes yes as i say working with villagers is not a frustrating experience at all So that was actually not that frustrating. After the first few were incredibly annoying, the rest just went in as a breeze. And now we have ourselves a fully functional iron farm in Minecraft 1.16. And already it is absolutely throwing out iron. Look, we've almost got five stacks already. And that's just in the time it took for me to take down the minecart rail and clean up the villager breeder over there. That's, that's nuts. Next project coming right up. Now for anyone who hasn't seen that episode, I'll quickly try my best to explain what this system does. Essentially, we've got a bunch of different bank accounts for all the different members of the Hermitcraft server. The people can select their bank accounts. Of course, they've got a balance on the inside of it. And when they purchase something, the balance will automatically 
be taken down a little bit. So however much this costs, for example, a piston costs 10 coins. If they purchase a piston, then 10 coins will be deducted from their bank account automatically. And there's also an overdraft system. So if they spend more money than they have, then that will be saved somewhere. So the next time they deposit Pacific coins, it will automatically be taken out of the account. That was wordy, okay? And I didn't breathe throughout the process of explaining that, so now I'm lightheaded. But there are some questions that I saw popping up quite a bit in the comment section that I quickly want to answer. Question number one, what happens if two people use it at once? Well, it doesn't really work. The last person to press the button would be the one with their bank account open, and they would be the one that is essentially paying for all of the things being purchased from Pacific. But the reason that this isn't much of a big issue is because I played on the Hermitcraft server for a very long time and I cannot remember a time where I've been in a shop where someone is also in the shop buying something. But if that did happen, then one person is just gonna have to be a little bit patient and wait for the other person to finish. Question number two, or suggestion number two. Shouldn't there be codes to all the bank accounts to stop stealing? We play on the Hermitcraft server, there's no stealing on the Hermitcraft server, all of the shops rely on trust, and I imagine this will work in exactly the same fashion. But with Pacific, there are two reasons to break kneecaps. If someone doesn't pay for their overdraft, and also, if they get caught stealing. Final question, why don't you use sunflowers for Pacific coins instead of slime balls? That is actually our plan. The slime balls that I had inside this system right here were just placeholders because I happen to have lots of them in my chests. The real system is actually going to be using sunflowers. But on the topic of Pacific coin, that's actually the reason that I'm here. Having created this system, I now need to work on the system that will convert your diamonds into Pacific coins. And I'm going to create two of them. The first one is going to be a fixed price Pacific coin. So it's a set amount of Pacific coin that you get for your diamonds. And the other one is going to be slightly different. And we'll get onto that in a second. Part one of the puzzle is to create an item filter. So of course this chest only accepts diamonds. And also the transfer of diamonds from this chest down into the system is also being slowed by this circuit back here and that's to make sure that we get a bunch of independent pulses through this redstone torch and also they're slow enough that this redstone torch doesn't burn out because if this burns out then that breaks everything although i have just realized i've made a horrible horrible error I'm not building it out of concrete. I mean, look how much better that looks. Next up, we're going to do the dropping of the Pacific coins, and I'm going to make it so that we get five Pacific coins for every single diamond that gets deposited. And I think this should all be everything. So we will stand here. This is where our Pacific coins will actually pop up to. And this should hopefully do the trick, fingers crossed. If I put 10 diamonds into this thing, then we should get 50 Pacific coins out. So let's see. Am I not actually able to pick them up or are they just incredible? Okay, we need some soul sand down there. I completely forgot about that. But eventually, they should reach the top. And I still can't pick them up. But the good news is when I eventually did pick them up by removing the half slab, there is actually 50 there. So the system is working. The only issues that I was having there are isolated to this very small space. All the redstone and things is fully functional. So this, this is good. But I'm going to be honest, I kind of like the other type of Pacific coin delivery system. That machine that we just created is a fixed price Pacific coin system. We get a set amount of Pacific coins per diamond and it stays that way forever. I want to create a variable price Pacific coin system where the price of Pacific coin changes over time. So the first part of this circuit is exactly the same as that circuit. We've got the item filter, then we've got the slowing down system. So the input of the diamonds is exactly the same. It's the output of this circuit which is going to be a little bit different. And I'm scratching my head just a tiny bit because, okay, so we're going to have a baseline of five. I think it should be a minimum of five Pacific coins per diamond. And then I think it can vary from five up to 10. That seems intelligent. That seems intelligent. And I, I think this way of doing things could work. I just need to run a different signal strength into this comparator right here. And I think I have a way to do it. And that way of doing it didn't work. But now I've thought of a new way of doing it. And it works through a series of randomizers. Now, first things first, I just want to mention this button. Obviously, this is just a test system. So I'm going to be giving it the inputs. But in the real design, these inputs will be done through a redstone clock that will hopefully adjust the valuation of Pacific coin every real life day. So every 24 hours, the value of Pacific coin could go up or down, or it could stay the same. And that's what this randomizer does. So if I hit this button, that time we got ourselves a redstone output. If I hit the button again, that time we didn't. So you saw value stay the same, no input actually went into the second part of the system. Now the second part of the circuit is just a randomizer which decides if this dropper gets powered or this dropper gets powered. If this dropper gets powered, then you'll get more Pacific coin for your diamonds. 
and if this dropper gets powered then you'll get less pacific coin for your diamonds now currently the price is seven pacific coin per diamond so if i just chuck a diamond inside here we should get seven slime balls outputted which that's fantastic that looks like it's worked now if i hit this button a couple of times we should get a slightly different valuation and now if we put these diamonds in here we now get six yeah, six. Took me an embarrassingly long time to do the math there, didn't it? Now, once again, you have to remember this is a test circuit. So in the real one, the output wouldn't be down at the bottom there. And also there would be redstone lamps, which show the daily value of Pacific coin, because I definitely think that's important. But as far as redstone circuits go, all of the logic and all of the actual information is here. It's ready to go. This could be installed into Pacific. The only thing is, I haven't got Iskal's approval. The reason I built up these two systems is because... Well, Iskal, Iskal hasn't told me which one he likes the idea of just yet, so I thought I would build both of them and then kind of present the pair of them to him and see which one he prefers. Who's the one who's not turning up to meetings now, Iskal? Who's the one who's not turning up to meetings now? I'm going to make myself feel better by murdering thousands of iron golems overnight. And I can confirm it worked. My mood is better and I feel content. So with my new lease on life, the first thing that I want to do is head into the Pacific building and work out where I'm actually going to construct the redstone structures that we've been working on. And... Oh yeah. <laughs> I totally forgot. I forgot about the fact that we have a lobby. You know, I was... Okay, we're going to have to do a little bit of... Uh, we're going to have to do a little bit of brain work here. I mean, with that being said, I think... How many blocks... I think it sticks out seven blocks behind it. So that would mean that the structure would be around about here-ish. Or potentially here. So we might have to remove one of these palm trees or kind of move them around a little bit, but that could potentially work. And of course, when I'm referring to the structure, I'm referring to the bank, like the actual banking system. I think I actually made it quite compact out the back. So that could function. That could be okay. And with the Pacific Coin delivery systems, I think I could kind of rewire them a little bit so that they would actually fit within the wall. I think it could be possible to do it inside this lobby area. But if it's not exploring other options, I mean, putting it up on a second floor probably isn't wise because a lot of the redstone is down underneath the ground. So that, that wouldn't really work too well. But of course, we do have the area underneath the lobby, the basement, which has infinite space underneath. And also, we could kind of put it across the back wall there. I mean, that that could that could function. I know that we've got the aquarium in the center, so we might have to work around that a little bit. But that could be okay. The only issue with something like that is the entrance to Pacific would have to then go in the side of the island because every person that enters Pacific has to select their bank account so they can see their balance and also make sure their account is selected so that when they buy things, it's actually coming out of their own account and not someone else's. Unless you did have some kind of identification system where you put a key card into Pacific to get access to Pacific and then that selects your account and also shows you your balance. That would be good, but that's also an awful lot of added complexity. I might have to speak to Iskal about this one. Now, I've been reading through the comments on my Industrial District episodes, and a few people have been pointing out that you can rename banners, and they will actually appear as names on a map. I genuinely... I had no clue that this was a thing. Let's see if this works how I think it does, because I think it's just as simple as placing down a renamed banner, but there could be all sorts of fancy things that I actually have to do to make this thing function. So if I just come over here and... plunk that there, that should... That should now be on the map. Let's have a look. No? <laughs> Is that not how it works? I should have expected that. I mean, I can see it on the map. But it doesn't have... It doesn't have a name attached to it. Okay, apparently it could be something to do with using a map on one of the banners. Let's see if this works. Here we go. And... <laughs> I mean, I assumed this wouldn't be the case. Oh! Oh! Oh, it has worked. Oh, it's just it's just appeared. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. So, so right-clicking on it actually did make it register, but on my map. That is really, really interesting. How did I not know that this was a thing? You know, this really is an incredibly satisfying process. Just seeing, wow, why is that so big? <laughs> why, why is Mob Farm so much bigger than all the other labels. I guess it's to do with the length of the label that you're giving it. So for example, Kelp Farm is also quite a short label, so I imagine that's also going to have quite a massive label. Yep, right, this should be the final one, and that should be the entire industrial district all fully labeled up. And I gotta say, this is a lot clearer 
than the outline system that I was using previously. Not that there was anything wrong with the outline system, I still think it looks incredibly cool, but I definitely think this looks a lot cooler. I mean, look at that. That is actually, now I'm quite impressed with that. And I really can't wait to get the rest of this industrial district all fully filled in. And look how much that looks like a bogey. That literally looks like someone has sneezed on my map. For goodness sake. Thanks for that one, Escal. And on that note, I think it's time to end. I hope that you enjoyed this very varied episode of Hermitcraft. We've worked on all sorts of different projects. There's something for everyone in this one. And please do check out episode one of the road trip on Grian's channel, episode two will be coming soon on my channel. See ya. And I've got to say, on the road trip fun, it was actually really fun to edit once I got into it. The issue is there's so much footage. Like, we have got just, you had four cameras, six different audio sources, and the iPads as well, which had the recordings of Minecraft Earth. Just getting all of that footage organized was a nightmare, but once I actually got it done, it was great. And the footage was fantastic, thanks to my friend Josh doing all the filming. It all came together really nicely, so I think you will enjoy it.